Let's pray. Precious Lord, heal our land. Heal us and we will be healed. Lord, I pray that where we have been unfocused, where we have let, let ourselves be distracted, you will bring us back to putting you at the center of our lives, at the center and everything of our lives. Lord, as I preach today, let your word speak through me. Use me today, Lord, as you wish to use everyone under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name, amen. What is a calling? This may sound like a strange thing to be asking in the middle of a global pandemic, but hear me out. The very word calling implies that there is a person who does the calling. If there is a God who calls us to do certain things, he didn't go away during the pandemic. I remember, I remember once having to sit through a seminar on calling um, the day after I returned from some really excruciatingly long flight. I think it might have been the day I got, like the week I got back from Oshkosh. I was exhausted. And the last thing I wanted to hear about was how to be um, the best of everything I could be because I was just too exhausted. And as, as the hours stretched on of this seminar on calling, I remember thinking, isn't this a first world problem? Isn't it enough for us to just survive? It's, I was wrong. It is not enough just to survive. Our calling matters. Our calling matters even for survival. Let me put it this way. God called each of us to do something, something. And the importance of whatever that is didn't go away when the pandemic came. The thing is that there are some who are required of, by their calling to provide the means for survival, but to infuse more into it than just scraping for survival. A calling from God is more than just what we do for work. It is more than just a dream. It is more than something we want to be. It's about how God created us from the inside out to worship him, to serve him, to honor him, and to give him glory in everything that we do. During this pandemic, he did not stop calling us. He designed us a certain way to do certain things. And the Bible has story after story of men and women who dealt with difficult times and followed their calling anyway. Even when the times were bleak, they found ways of doing what God called them to do. One of these was Jeremiah. And the opening lines of the book that bear his name give a historical snapshot of just how insane his times were. These are the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests from the town of Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. The Lord first gave messages to Jeremiah during the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. King Josiah was a good king. He had taken the time to lead the nation of Judah through a time of national spiritual revival. It was during this time period that Jeremiah, as a very young boy, was called to be a prophet. But here's the thing. It wasn't just Josiah's reign that Jeremiah was called to pro be prophesied through. The Lord's messages continued throughout the reign of King Jehoiakim, Josiah's son, until the 11th year of the reign of King Zedekiah, another of Josiah's sons. Wait, two sons, two brothers were king? What happened there? Well, King Josiah died prematurely in battle, and it was a huge spiritual crisis for the nation. People mourned him and lamented for him. Jeremiah, I believe, even composed a lament for King Josiah. And that's what put Jehoiakim on the throne. Then there was political turmoil. Back and forth, the nation couldn't decide whether to align itself with Egypt or Babylon. 
And in the course of things, King Jehoiakim was killed, and his brother Zedekiah was placed on the throne. And if that's not enough, difficult times for Jeremiah to work through. In August of that 11th year, the people of Jerusalem were taken away as captives. Jeremiah had the thankless task of being a prophet during the most traumatic event of the entire kingdom of Judah's history. I cannot overstate how traumatizing it was for the people of Judah to watch, to watch the temple be smashed to pieces and to be uprooted from the land that God had promised to them. It is in the middle of a reality like this, in the middle of a reality where it would be tempting to focus on mere survival, that Jeremiah followed his, followed his calling. And I tell you something, the book of Jeremiah is probably the bleakest, most depressing book of the Bible. In seminary, I had the distinct privilege of studying the book of Jeremiah a good 15 hours a week of actual class time, which is a lot when you translate that into the coursework. And, the, and it nearly broke me in some very profound ways, because the book of Jeremiah comes from the mind of a prophet who is deeply depressed by the situation he sees. It comes from a prophet who, in, who really was sensitive to just how difficult his times were. Not unlike our times now. But even in these times, even in times of uncertainty, times of doubt, God has still given us a destiny. God gives each of us a calling. Let's look at Jeremiah's calling in chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. It says, The Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. God had a calling for Jeremiah in mind before he was even conceived. God designed Jeremiah for this purpose. We hear a lot about the calling stories of prophets and religious figures, but no matter what it is that God designed you to do, he put that in your DNA before you were even born. Whatever you are called to do, God set you up with that. He gave it to you. He has given us each something that we individually are meant to offer the world, something that no one else can do. And the stunning diversity of, of things that God has called people to do in the world is one of my favorite things about the variety of the human experience. Uh, so many of you have such a wide range of callings that I've seen at work here in our community. If you're not sure what your calling is, think for a moment about what makes you who you are. Maybe you've been living in survival mode for so long that you've forgotten what that is. And that's understandable. But if that's the case, here's a good test. What do you still care about even when you are barely surviving? What keeps you getting out of bed even when the rest of the world makes you want to stay? That might be a clue as to what your calling is. What still has the power to light your eyes up when the rest of the world is depressing? Frequently, the way God nourishes our souls is also an indicator of how he wishes us to refresh others. Are you fed by visual beauty? Perhaps God has a work of visual art he wishes for you to create. Are you fed by the company of friends and family? Perhaps he is calling you to relate socially and to meet people's needs there. These are things that God hardwired into you, both as a way to feed your own soul and to refresh others. God doesn't just give us a calling to go do something. 
it's hardwired into how, how he designed us. It's hardwired into how we see the world. And each and every one is needed, necessary, and valuable. Now, you may be thinking about these, about the things that um, inspire you, about how God feeds you, and thinking, I can't do that for other people. I don't have skills. I have serious doubts about my calling. Well, God equips us for our calling. Let me tell you something. When I first had an inkling that God was calling me to pastoral ministry, it was terrifying beyond all reason. I had all kinds of excuses to give him, including some that other people would later throw at me. Um, Jeremiah here says, O oh, sovereign Lord, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. That one was one of the ones I gave God. My gender was another. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. No matter what our doubts are about our calling, no matter what our excuse is, I'm too young, I don't look like people who do that thing, there's a pandemic on. God still has a way to use you, and he will equip you to do it. He will give you the tools in your hands to do the thing that he has called you to do. Jeremiah was wise to admit that he was young. He was wise to admit that he was inexperienced. Only a fool would desire the office of prophet in a troubled time. Only a fool would presume to speak for God without being dragged, kicking and screaming into it. When Jeremiah says he's too young, he is like Solomon saying, I cannot lead these people, for I am only a little child. That's the attitude that God can actually work with. Because the Lord, the Lord replied to Jeremiah, don't say, I'm too young. For you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. Don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, Look, I have put my words in your mouth. Today, I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some you must uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow. Others you must build up and plant. So what's going on here? What's God telling Jeremiah? He's telling Jeremiah that I will equip you for what I am calling you to do. I will put the words in your mouth. Jeremiah had a gift with words. In fact, he had such a gift with words that translating portions of the book that bear his name presents a real challenge to modern scholars. He has a wider variety of vocabulary than any other writer of the Bible. And his metaphors are so vivid and so expressive. Jeremiah, with this God-given talent of working with words, could have done all kinds of terrible things with it. There were other prophets in his time who used their skills of communication to tell falsehoods, to say that everything's fine, the temple isn't going to fall. Jeremiah is such a downer, don't listen to him. But Jeremiah spoke the truth that God gave him. He used the tools that God equipped him with and submitted his gift, submitted his calling to God. He said, this is you, not me. His obedience mattered more than his skills. When God calls you to do something, if your skills don't match yet, that's okay. Stay open to that relationship with God and let him equip you. So many, of, so many of the gifts and talents I see 
in each of you are amazing when they are put in the hands of God. I have seen God do incredible things through, some of you have this incredible gift of hospitality, of making people feel like a million bucks the minute you see them. Some of you have this quiet gift of service where others in the church may not even know your name, but the things you do invisibly create so much joy for others in a sweet anonymity. Some of you, do the very silent work of prayer for this community that is ever so vital and don't receive a scrap of credit for it. Some of you have artistic and musical talents. Some of you have great gifts of logic and reasoning. And I love watching your gifts at work. It's one of the things I miss most about being here in person, is being able to see that stuff at work the interplay of that great and grand ecosystem. But here's the thing. When those gifts are not submitted to God, when those gifts are not exercised, they can become a liability. And when you don't exercise those gifts, when you don't do those things that both make you a blessing to others and allow God to bless you, it's easy to let the darker side of your nature take over and descend into a place that's neither good for you or the people around you. And I'm not saying this as someone whose hands are clean of the exact same phenomenon. I think at this point in the pandemic, everyone has had a moment where they've been so cut off from the things that make them tick that God designed for them to do that they've slid into the worst version of themselves. But today, today I want to encourage you. What makes you tick? What has God called you to do? What will you let him equip you to do that will not only feed you, but the others around you and perhaps lift you out of those less pleasant parts of ourselves? If you have passions that have been starving in quarantine, I invite you to find ways of enjoying those so that God can bless you, flow through you, and bless others. Now, it can be terrifying to actually put ourselves out there and follow our calling. Truly terrifying, because it's easier to put on a mask, so to speak, and try to fit into a mold than it is to really serve out of who we are, to really serve out of who God designed us to be. I don't think Jeremiah was just concerned about his youth, and I don't think he was even just concerned about putting himself out there even. Jeremiah had the hideously difficult and dangerous task of telling the truth about a nation that had seen itself as superior to all other nations, but was really on a spiritual decline. This message nearly got him killed more than once. It got him tossed in a pit where he sank into the mud. It got him accused of being a false prophet. It got him, not, it got him ending up with the group of exiles he never wanted to end up with. If you read the narrative parts of Jeremiah, you will be astonished by all of the things that Jeremiah's prophetic calling costs him. So how did he survive? He even got accused of being a defector to the Babylonians at one point. How did he survive being accused even of treason? Well, God protects us in our calling. I'm not saying that God will always and forever protect us from every danger possible. Jeremiah did end up in the pit. But he protects us to accomplish the things he has designed us to do. Let's see what God tells Jeremiah here about how he will protect him. It's in verse 17 to 19. Get up and prepare for action. Go out and tell them everything I tell you to say. Do not be afraid of them 
or I will make you look foolish in front of them. For see, today I have made you strong, like a fortified city that cannot be captured, like an iron pillar or a bronze wall. You will stand against the whole land, the kings, officials, priests, and people of Judah. They will fight you, but they will fail, for I am with you, and I will take care of you. I, the Lord, have spoken. These words are both a command and a promise. God tells Jeremiah not to be afraid because God himself will protect him. I love the line where he says, do not be afraid of them or I will make you look foolish in front of them. Back in high school, I would go to Redwood Camp meeting, well, from when I was seven years on, I would go all the way up north to the woods to Redwood Camp meeting to refresh my soul in the company of peers my own age, time with my grandparents, time among the majestic Redwoods. And in high school, they, they had in the youth division a talent show. And I decided to enter to do stand-up comedy. Yeah, really, Pastor Jillian, stand-up comedy? You're not that funny. Well, I was still in that phase of life where I was trying things. And I decided to build my routine around the issue of stage fright. But a couple of days into preparing my routine about stage fright, I realized that I too suffered from stage fright. And I confided in one of the recruiters from, the, from PUC's recruiting booth, and he told me something wise that stuck with me. The thing about stage fright is that when you face those people, don't be afraid of those people. Love those people. You love this audience. Love them. It matters less how well you perform than how well you love those people. Elsewhere in the Bible, it talks about how love Perfect love casts out all fear. And it shows how so many people have managed to put their fear underground in the name of love. Jeremiah, I am convinced from reading the poetry portions of his book, was able to do what he did with less fear because of his deep empathy and compassion for the people of Jerusalem even as he was more aware than even they were of the depths to which they were descending spiritually. I see an incredibly sensitive prophet who was pained by what he saw, but did not let fear get in the way of loving these people who needed to hear about a God who cared for them and wanted so badly for them to repent before it would come down to exile. Perfect love casts out all fear. At the center of every calling that God gives us is love. It is love that caused God to call us to the different things that we do. It is love that equips us. It is love that protects us. It is love that died for us 2,000 years ago. There's this book written by a French philosopher named Voltaire called Candide. And in the book Candide, there is a group of of young friends instructed by their wise teacher Pangloss who suffer every single misfortune their time period can throw at them. Their country is invaded, they experience the Spanish Inquisition, They experience the Lisbon earthquake. They end up getting sold into slavery and shipped to the Americas at one point. And at the end of all of these sufferings, horrible, horrific sufferings, they're working on a garden. And Dr. Pangloss is trying to explain to the young people, well, this had to happen, so this could happen, and this had to happen, so that could happen, and this, and was trying to make sense of 
everything they had been through logically. But I find wisdom in the line the book ends on. Candide turns to his teacher Pangloss and says, that very well may be, but let's tend our garden. Let's tend our garden. Our calling is like a garden. It may be a bit of a desolate place right now, like this barren forest that's in the back of, of these slides I'm showing you this morning. But this garden is something that God has given us to tend. We have been given a calling. We have been given a work to do that has not gone away just because the garden has fallen on hard times. We have been given, we have been given the great gift of participating with God in doing his work in this world. Perhaps it is a family to care for. Perhaps it is a profession where God can use you as a light. Whatever it is, we can't be so distracted by trying to make sense of why the garden's a mess when what we actually need to be doing is raking the leaves and pulling the weeds. And God knows that this garden is a bit of a mess. He knows it better than we do. We don't have the full capacity to appreciate what a mess the garden is. But he has promised to give us the tools to do it. When we look at the state of the garden and realize that, okay, we don't have the muscle power to do this ourselves, and we give God permission to equip us with what we need to work on that garden, he can take the talents that some of us have been using as swords and beat them into shovels that we can use to dig up those weeds and start replanting. We do not mind the garden so much as God minds it through us. Now God knows that sometimes working in that garden is scary. He knows that we have fears about putting ourselves out there. I've been issuing challenges since the beginning of the pandemic about picking up the phone and calling those people who haven't heard from you in months, but I'll admit that it's a scary thing for me to do too. And if you're one of those friends who, to whom I owe a call that, and happens to be listening to this right now, I am so sorry. But it has to start somewhere. If we pick up, if we pick up the, the shovel and start working, if we pick up that phone and call that person and focus on instead of why is the garden a mess, who made this garden a mess, and instead ask the question, Lord of the garden, what is it you would have me do in this garden, weedy as it is, we'll get a lot farther. When we follow our calling, when we let God equip us and trust in his protection, he is able to use us to take where there might have been something very bleak and make beauty, pockets of beauty, bits of blessings that make the world a better place. The people of Jeremiah's time, most of them didn't listen to him. They did throw him in jail. They put him in a pit. They accused him of defecting to the Babylonians. But even so, the words that he left behind pointed forward to the Messiah. The words he left behind pointed forward to when Cyrus, who I believe at that point had not been born yet, would issue the order for rebuilding. You know who read Jeremiah? Daniel. Daniel read Jeremiah and prayed for the prophecies contained there to be fulfilled, and they were. And Jeremiah had this prophecy about a righteous branch, the Messiah, who would one day fully redeem Israel from its sin. And that message is still with us today. Sometimes the best you can hope for when you sweat blood and tears at your calling, when you give it everything, is just to create pockets, pinpricks of hope. But if you ask me, even a pocket, even a pinprick of hope is worth fighting for.
Let's pray. Precious Lord, it is so easy for us to get distracted with the why and the who of the state of this garden. But Lord, you have given each of us a calling and you have promised to equip us for that calling and you have promised to protect us in that calling. Lord, I pray that you will give us the courage to let you tend the garden through us. Lord, I pray that you will open up our hearts to receive your love and pass it on to others. Lord, forgive us for where we have let some of the good things you've designed us with turn into swords instead of surrendering them to you to be tools. Help us, Lord, to submit our whole selves to you. Help us to love like you do. Help us to serve from a place of love. Help us to approach every activity of our lives as an act of worship. Lord, as we go into this week, let us be attentive to your voice. Let us be open to where you want to work through us. All these blessings I pray upon your people from now until you come. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>